Hi, my name is Dr. Scott Kellogg. I'm a clinical psychologist and psychotherapist in New York City. And I've come to you today to speak about chair work, which is a form of psychotherapy that I've been working with for a long time, which I think might be very interesting to you and something you might want to consider for your work. So the great irony of chair work is that chair work has nothing to do with chairs. Chairs is based the idea, or chair work is based on the idea that it is healing and transformative for people to give voice to their different inner parts, modes, or selves, and for people to enact or reenact scenes from the past, the present, or the future. Chair work was created by Dr. Jacob Moreno. Dr. Moreno was the founder and the creator of psychodrama, and he's really responsible for all the experiential therapy techniques. Really, all experiential work has its roots in Dr. Moreno's work and in psychodrama. But we've, we've come to know chair work really through the work of Frederick or Fritz Perls, Dr. Perls, who's the creator of Gestalt therapy. During the 1950s, Fritz Perls spent a lot of time working with Moreno in New York City. Moreno used to have these Sunday night kind of open psychodrama sessions, and Perls was a regular attendee. And it's here that Perls learned chair work from Moreno. If we look at the history of psychoanalysis, we know that actually Breuer created psychoanalysis but Freud took it from Breuer and really ran with it and made it a whole you know, amazing uh, psychotherapeutic approach. In the same way, Moreno creates chair work, but Pearls takes it way beyond anything that Moreno had thought of and really turns it into what I would see as a psychotherapeutic art form. In terms of myself, how did I actually get into chair work? So in 2001, I was at the beginning of my training as a schema therapist, and I was working with a patient. And this patient says, you know, I really, I can't stand authority. I can't stand it when people tell me what to do. It's really an issue. And right now in my life, many people are telling me what to do because of some of my financial situations. And I'm really, really unhappy. So being a schema therapist, I said to him, well, why don't you close your eyes and bring up an image or bring up a memory from the past that somehow connects to this situation. And he brought up this memory of being with his father. And this patient, as a young man, as a boy, young man, was a very good tennis player, and his father also was a very good tennis player. And the father used to try to teach him how to play tennis, and they would have these sort of horrendous sessions where the father would be yelling at him, no, it's wrong, do it this way, try it again. And it was a sort of brutal encounter that went on for years and years of the father coaching his son in tennis and the son resenting it and um, you know, being very unhappy. So I said to the patient, I said, why don't you sit here in this chair and imagine your father over here and just talk to him about this experience. You know, the patient says, you know, Dad, I love you, but I hated when you taught me tennis. That was horrifying. You know, you were so mean to me, you were so cruel to me. You know, and he let out all of his anger, you know, and rage at these experiences that went on for years. And then I said, why don't you s switch and come over here and be your father? And, you know, like many parents, this father is a good man, but he's just very anxious. And the father said, you know, I would, I was so worried you wouldn't get it right. I was so worried you'd learn the wrong way. I mean, you'd make mistakes. I and mean, I wanted to make sure you learned it the right way. They said, come back over here. Why don't you respond to your father? And I had him go back and forth a few times. I kind of fumbled my way through this. You know, we kind of brought this session to an end. Nothing particularly dramatic had happened, but we had given voice to himself and to his father. A week later, he comes back to the session, and he says to me, doctor, you've cured me. I no longer have any issues with authority. People have been telling me what to do a week long, and I'm totally at peace with it. Well, I had heard of one session cures, but I had never actually seen one before. And this man, this seemed to resolve the issue of going, going back to the past, reenacting this, this story using the chairs, and this changed him. And after this moment, I was sort of really fascinated with chair work, and I've been studying it ever since. So that's been about 16 or 17 years I've been focused on this technique. How might we conceive of chair work? Basically, there are fundamentally two approaches. In the external dialogues, the patient sits in this chair, and they imagine somebody from the past, the present, or the future in the chair opposite. So here we can speak to a deceased grandfather. We can talk to a spouse. We can even talk to an unborn child. This is a place where a relationship can take place. We can express our, our love, our anger, our fear, and our sorrow, and our grief. Explore those things. Another way to do this is internal conflicts, internal dialogues with different parts of the self. For example, I want to move to California. I want to stay in New York City. 
some sort of conflict, some sort of encounter between different energies, parts of the cells. And we speak from these different viewpoints. Jack Kornfield, who's a Buddhist psychologist, said, it is possible to speak with our heart directly. We can actually converse with our heart as if it were a good friend. Sort of a beautiful passage. I don't know if Dr. Kornfield actually uses chair work, but here we actually could put our heart on the chair and speak to our heart or speak from our heart and speak to these different energies or aspects within us. And of course, most of the work we do, you'll find is a mixture between the internal and the external. And as you get more comfortable with working this way, you'll flow between these two dimensions. First example, grief and loss. Bell Hooks, who's a social theorist in the United States, wrote a book about love. And in her book, she talked about a romantic uh, heartbreak that she went through. And she, she wrote, at the time, I was often overwhelmed by grief, so profound. It seemed as though an immense sea of pain was washing my heart and my soul away. In my head, I engaged in imaginary conversations about the meaning of love with him. So here she's talking to her, her absent lover, the man she's no longer in her life. And what I think this tells us is that we all speak to people who aren't present, especially in situations of grief, but perhaps not only. And the idea of talking to people who are not physically present is something that all human beings engage in, which means that chair work is not a strange behavior. It's not a foreign or alien activity. It's something that we're doing already. But whether we do it in a way that's healing or whether we do it in a way that's clinically effective is another question. A woman and her husband had a child, and the child had a heart uh, defect of some kind. And when the child was about a year old, the doctor said, I think we should do surgery on your baby. They did the surgery, and the child died consequent to the operation. And the mother plunged into a deep state of guilt and depression and despair, and basically a state of pathological mourning. In the late 60s, she came to a gestalt therapy workshop and brought this issue up, and she had been trapped in this state of pathological mourning for 16 years. She had not been able to resolve the sense that she had made a mistake and killed her child, filled with depression. The therapist said, why don't you sit in this chair and imagine your baby, imagine your child sitting over here and talk to your child. And the mother said something to the effect of, baby, I love you so much, I'm so sorry, I'm a terrible mother, I made a mistake, I didn't mean to kill you. Out comes the grief and the despair and the anguish about this, this mistake. And then the therapist says, why don't you come over here and be your child, let the child speak, let's see what the child says. And you would think that people would control what comes out of their mouth when they do this, but in fact all kinds of things emerge in, in the creativity of the moment that you wouldn't expect. When she sits here and gives voice to the child, the child said, you know, I wanted to live a full life. I did not want to be a crippled person. I would have made the same decision you did. You did the right thing even though I died. Wow, you know, where did that come from? Sort of an astonishing voice of this child. Because of course, in these situations, she's only thinking of her perspective and never thinking of the perspective of the child. And the therapist says, come back over here, and can you take in what your child just said to you? And as she sits here, she sort of bursts into tears and is able to finally release this depression and this guilt and this anger and finally let go of this mourning situation, right? So this is one of these extraordinary stories from the late 60s that made chair work famous in psychotherapy because people had never seen these kinds of healings quickly. Another way of using chair work is something called self-doubling. And self-doubling comes from the psychodrama tradition and involves two techniques that are core to um, um, psychodrama. And this is a technique that you use with a difficult relationship. So someone, a patient who's someone in their life they're having trouble with, they're unhappy with, it may be contentious, but it's someone they're going to keep in their life most likely. It's not someone who's an abuser. It's also good if, you're, if you have difficulty with a patient to, to do this, with, with a, imagining with a patient. And here we're going to invite the, the person to speak freely. And it's very important you say that to them. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is not assertiveness training. We're not preparing them for a real conversation. This is a place where we speak. We say whatever we're feeling freely and it stays in this room. So there are two aspects to this. The first one is role, is, um, role reversal. And role reversal is when a person plays another person. You saw, you saw us do this before with a child. Tian Dayton, a famous psychodramatist, said, role reversal allows us to temporarily leave the self and experience the position of the other. And for Moreno, this is one of the great um, 
the great insights and the great sort of discoveries of the psychodramatic tradition is this idea of role reversal. So you invite the patient to sit in this chair and you say, can you imagine this difficult person, whoever this may be, in the chair opposite, and I want you to speak freely from this position. So they speak about their anger or their frustration or their fear or their disappointment, whatever it is, they speak freely about the situation. After they've done that for a while, I would then invite the, the patient, would you stand here? And this is the self-doubling aspect. Stand behind the chair. And I say to them, as you're standing here, first of all, how does this person look? And often when people stand here and they look at the person, the person looks different than they did when they were sitting. This, even though it's just standing from sitting, it seems to shift the set in many ways. And the second thing is, is there anything you're thinking or feeling that you did not express when you were sitting down that you're feeling here? So a patient might say something like, when I was sitting here, I was filled with rage. But as I stand here, I feel hopeless. I feel despairing that we're never going to solve this problem. I have the patient sit down here, then I invite them to sit over here, and I invite them now to be this patient. And so as they are that patient, I will often sit over here, and I will interview them as the patient. So tell me your story, speak from your inner truth. What is going on with you? you know, how do you see things? What do you feel about, about the person over here? And often when you do this, you get below the surface, you find that they're in a great deal of pain or suffering, something is going on with them, and that's driving the difficult behavior. And then I invite them to also stand behind here. Is there anything you're thinking or feeling you didn't say when you were sitting down here? And then can you go back to your original seat? And then I would say to the patient, how do they look to you now? And not always, but often they look very different. And here we see, you know, they've been through actually an empathic encounter. There's a shift that takes place. I feel more kindly to them. I feel more sympathetic. I, I see, I'm less angry. I see that they are in pain too. I may not have an answer, but there is definitely a shift that takes place. And then one more time, can you stand behind anything you're thinking or feeling you didn't say when you're sitting down? And then I take them out and debrief them. And this often gives people hope to begin again with people, with your patients, also the difficult patients. It gives you a sense of, I, I want to be back in the fight. I can feel their pain. I'm less angry at, at their behavior. Right? Doesn't solve every problem, of course, but at least it gives it a new energy to begin again. So it's a very beautiful, very powerful way of working. It also captures this idea that you know, we have different levels of emotion, emotions on the surface, you know, and then deeper emotions in, inside. We get to work with these different dimensions, these different levels of the self. Working with trauma. So a couple of things I like to do with, with trauma. The first one is what psychodramas call monologue or soliloquy which is I invite the patient to sit in a special chair and tell me the story of what happened. Right? And I believe there's great power in this trauma-centered trauma storytelling. Sit here in a separate place, tell me the story of what went wrong. And then I'll, I will invite them to tell me the story again. And then I will invite them to tell me the story again. And then I will invite them to tell me the story again. And as you probably know, most people have rarely told the stories of their trauma. And for people to go and tell the story of a trauma four or five times in a row is an amazing experience for people. It rarely happens naturally. Right? And very, a lot of emotion gets evoked from that, a lot of crying. And the story also starts getting more elaborated. And one way you tell people are getting better with their traumas is the, is the story gets more complicated. Usually when they tell the story the first time, there are very few details. Right? The other thing that's good for the therapist is that we can begin to habituate to the story. It's horrifying to hear these stories. It's disturbing, it's frightening to hear these stories. But you hear it three times, four times, you get more comfortable with the story. And you can begin to talk about the story more freely. But again, you have to monitor the patient, right? Not everybody can do this. You know, it's, kind of, it's a form of exposure therapy in a way. So you watch what they're doing and uh, how they're doing, check in with them. But if they could tell it four times, five times, that is a profoundly life-changing event. Then we can use chair work to have a whole series of conversations, right? We can have the patient can talk to the person who hurt them, right? Often you find that patients are most upset, uh, not only at the person who hurt them, but people that knew that they were being hurt and did not protect them, right? So stereotypically, 
The daughter is being abused by the mother's boyfriend or stepfather. The mother knows about it and the mother doesn't intervene, right? To play a stereotype. And there's rage at the mother. Another thing we can do here is have the, the patient talk to the child self, if it's childhood abuse and mistreatment. And not only can the patient talk to these people, but the therapist can talk to these people. You know, I can talk to, these, to the abuser, I can talk to the patient, and I can talk to the child. Tragically, many people who have been mistreated, have been abused, have a great deal of difficulty talking in any kind of compassionate way to their child self. So here, I can talk to the child self. I can come down on the level, talk to this child as a child, and model for the patient, how do you talk to this child self, right? Very difficult. One of the tragedies of trauma that you, um, the patients can't do that. They actually judge themselves harshly, these poor children. So of course, this is you know, an ongoing process, not one session to solve these problems, but we can move this through this way, and we kind of reenact this scene in many ways. Another thing you can do is, is see, where do you want the abuser to be? That's too close. We can move the abuser further away. We can take another chair and block the abuser to give more protection to the patient. Have the patient stand behind the chair. Right? This gives more protection, more power to the patient. So you check in with the patient. One thing I would strongly suggest that you do not do is that you do not have the patient sit in the chair of the abuser. As I mentioned before with role, role reversal, when you play somebody else, you become empathic to that person. And if the patient goes and plays the abuser, they may become empathic to the abuser. I realize that he was mistreated. I remember something bad happened to him. I feel bad for him. But the goal here, one of the goals here, is for the patient to be able to get angry, as you'll see in a minute. Because anger can be healing because anger leads to grief, and it's grief that heals. I spent several years working in a study of post-traumatic stress disorder and drug addiction in New Haven. And part of that study, we talked to many patients, many, many people who'd been through abuse histories. And I talked about their abuse at length, sort of went through all their traumas. And a number of women told me, they said, who'd been through these horrifying experiences, they said, you know, the worst abuse is emotional abuse. Those words get into your heart, they get into your soul, they just eat away at you. So I always like to pass on their teaching that we should never underestimate the power of emotional abuse. So here we can fight back, we can repudiate the toxic messages, we can affirm the needs of these children. Right, so we do a whole reenactment, reworking of, of those scenes. In a case by Larry Butler, he talked about putting a woman in the chair and her grandmother in the chair opposite. And he said, and the, and the woman said to the grandmother, you're so mean. I hate you. I do love you, but I hate you. In that phrase, we see the ambivalence that people have about people who hurt them. I love you and I hate you. I hate being here with you. You constantly talk about dying and death. Death, that's it. Every day. Every day. I resent the times you called me a tramp. I was never a tramp. You always said you'll become pregnant. I never did things like that. But you always said I was no good, a slut. I resent you for not trusting me, for not letting me be a young person. I resent you for dragging me to cemeteries to see dead graves. I resent that. So here, this woman was probably in a situation at 16 where she could not speak to this grandmother in her anger. She was dependent on the grandmother. But here again, now she can get angry. And, and out of this anger, releasing that anger, she can then eventually move to grief. Why didn't you love me? Why didn't you care for me? Why did you lecture me constantly? Why weren't you there with me? We missed an opportunity to be together. So that's where the healing, I think, can take place, as well as talking to the child self. Another way to work with trauma is something called cognitive processing therapy. And this is the work of Dr. Patricia Resick from the University of South Carolina Medical School. And her understanding of trauma, she says, is, and this is especially true for adult trauma, I would say, is that we have an understanding of the world. We have sort of a scheme about how the world works, how the world operates, who we are, and the nature of things in the world. And then the trauma takes place, the car accident, the mugging, the attack, the assault, the building collapse, something dreadful happens. And then we are thrown into a new schema set, you know, of fear, anxiety, you know, uh, not trusting people. We're in a whole new world. And she said the problem that we're faced, patients faced with is that this new schema is highly emotional and highly skewed, right? It's very fear-driven. It's actually completely disconnected with the old schema. And it's the disconnection between the old schema system and the new schema system that keeps the PTSD going. It's an interesting idea. 
And her work is to try to integrate these two schemas together. And I don't think she uses chair work, but chair work is perfect for this kind of encounter. So I've had a couple of uh, women I worked with who have been in, in sort of attacks and assaults. One in particular said, before I was assaulted, I trusted 90% of people, and I didn't trust about 10%. After the assault took place, I mistrusted about 90% of all the people, and maybe I trusted 10% 10 10 on a good day, right? So we see a dramatic shift in how she sees the world. But as we begin to engage with these two parts, talking to each other, how did you see the world before? How did you see the world afterwards? She eventually gets to a place of, OK, I'm willing to try and trust 50%. Right? A new schema, a third schema emerges, which both includes the old way of looking at the world and the new way of looking at the world. Because this is too extreme. Right? But this one does not take in this new experience and this new information. So here, this sort of extraordinary chance to uh, engage and create a kind of a third option that's healing. Many people come to therapy because they need to make decisions. Shall I stay in my job? Shall I leave my job? Shall I stay in this marriage? Shall I retire? Shall I keep working? Shall I move to Florida? Shall I stay in New York? What shall I do? And here each chair can represent a side of an argument. I want to stay in my current job. I want to take, the, take a new job. And we can, using chairs, which is much more emotional than just simply a cognitive discussion, we can help people get more of an emotional valence of each of these two sides. So I worked with a man who had run, uh, he'd been an entrepreneur, he'd run a business for many years, he'd been quite successful. At one point the economy changes, he shuts down his business, and he was now working for a um, corporate law firm. So he was not a lawyer, so he's actually working in a law firm, but not as a lawyer. And he's full of complaints. You know, I, I don't like my boss, I don't like the commute, I don't like the money, I don't like the job. Lots of complaining in the therapy session. I want to go out, I want to start a new business, you know, I've done it before, I can do it again. It all sounds good, Why don't, let's go and do it, but in fact, he doesn't do it. So there's something going on there. Right? So I say to him, why don't you sit in this chair and speak from the unhappiness? Don't like the boss, don't like the job, don't like the commute, don't like the money. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go out, I want to start my business. Right? And I said, come over here and be the part that maybe doesn't want to do that or has some objection. And what was interesting is that when we did this, things began to emerge in this chair that had not been clear in the discussion. He said, you know, I'm getting older. I want to retire at some point. I'm worried about my money. I want safety. I want security. I want to stay in this job. Right? This voice had not been so clear in a conversation, but it emerges in the chairs. I have him go back and forth, back here. No, I hate the job. I want to leave. I'm worried. I want safety. I want security. We go back and forth and back and forth. Then I bring him over here. And I say, so where are you with this now? And he said, I'm going to stay. And essentially, he went from a 50-50 dilemma to a kind of a 75-25 resolution. It didn't mean that he suddenly loved this job, but this tension, this back and forth um, that he'd been in was, you know, found, found resolution. Uh, and at that point, he sort of was seen to be content with the job. I actually ran to him a year after the therapy ended, and he was still at the job, so it seemed to last. Because what happens for most of us in our life is that we spend a bunch of hours on this side, and then we spend a bunch of hours on this side, and we never have the two sides talk to each other. Right? Fritz Perls um, was very interested in this in his work on polarities. And while in some cases people are faced with decisions where there actually is an answer, uh, you know, do I move to Florida, or do I stay in New York, other problems in life are really dilemmas or polarities that we have to manage them. We're never going to solve these problems, right? We, we're going to, they're going to keep coming up. You know, when do I choose courage? When do I choose fear? When do I choose adventure? When do I choose safety? When do I focus on, on the needs of myself as an individual? When do I focus on the needs of my family, friends, community, the larger social group, right? These are things we're going to be constantly wrestling with. We'll find temporary solutions, but it comes back again. It's a very interesting idea to see these as polarities that need to be managed. That these are not problems that are going to be solved. And Pearls taught us to, one, get people to speak very clearly, very distinctly from each of these polarities. And he would have them speak very strongly with a lot of emotion, a lot of affect, a lot of ownership. You know, this is what I want. No, this is what I want. Perhaps they would actually talk to each other as well. But he said, in this space in the center, this is the creative potential. These are the creative possibilities of the individual. 
If you let people have this encounter, they will find their solution. Right? You don't have to solve their problems. Our work is to create the encounter. I find that very relieving because I don't have to solve their problems. And unlike sort of CBT, where there's more emphasis on solving it, they will find the solution. I remember a woman being very torn between taking care of her, her, her older, elderly mother and, fit, and her needs of her children and her husband. And she was kind of in this complicated thing. What do I do? And she felt, kind of felt like I was taking care of the mother, maybe neglecting her family, lots of distress. And when we did this, she kind of came to the third space of, you know, I can make a decision, kind of claiming power, I can get this under control, I can find an answer here. But instead of like running for what everybody wants, she said, I will make my decision and I will claim power. And that's the kind of thing that Pearls was talking about. One more uh, scenario. Inner critic self-hatred. So as I'm sure you've seen with many of your patients, many patients are filled with thoughts of self-hatred, self-attack, self-criticism, right? My whole therapy practice is full of people who are attacking themselves and, and saying horrible things about themselves. Freud called this the superego. It's commonly referred to as the inner critic. When we look at this literature, we find that the masters actually take two different perspectives on the inner critic. Some people say the inner critic is a voice, the inner critic is a part of the self, that needs to be integrated into the greater sort of community of selves that take place within us. That it's the fact that the critic is not integrated which makes it so harsh and which makes it so sort of destructive. Other people say these critical voices are murderous, these critical voices are incredibly pathogenic and they should not be integrated into the self. I remember one patient, um, sort of borderline spectrum patient, who had this voice in her head all day long saying, will you please commit suicide? I hate you, I hate the fact you're alive please die today. If you can imagine all day long this voice is going through her head. So here we have the master saying two opposite things. Do we, do we integrate these voices? Do we isolate these voices? What do we do? I think when you actually talk to these voices you find a couple of things. You find for, the, for many people these voices are actually quite anxious and there, some people believe that the critic develops actually as a way to protect the child. You learn early on in life that you know, if you do the wrong thing, things happen. And the critic essentially says, I'm trying to take care of this child or this person by sort of yelling at them all the time. And when you talk to them, the voice is like, I'm just, if she would only do what I said, if he would only do what I said, we would be safe. Right? And you get this idea that the voice is trying to actually serving the well-being of the patient. But other voices are often interjects of abusive figures or pathogenic figures in, in their childhood saying, you know, I hate you, I want to kill you, I want to murder you. And people say, I hear, I hear the abuser in my mind, right? So you can see why we come to do different conclusions because different people are working with different, um, different voices. My sort of pseudo statistic on this is that about, probably about 90% of the voices are really anxiety driven and about 10% are really kind of this kind of murderous, pathogenic, destructive voices. And some are kind of a mixture of the two. So what do we do? So one thing I like to do is actually have the patient sit in the chair. I say, can you be your inner critic? And then I will sit in this chair opposite and I will actually interview that part. I say, so let me just interview the critic and sort of see what it's about. And this is from the voice dialogue tradition, uh, basically interviewing a part. You know, so who are you? Where are you from? When did you come into you know, Johnny's life or Susie's life? What's your purpose? How do you feel about Johnny or Susie? What are your hopes, your goals, your fears, your anxieties? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And again, for the most part, it's usually an anxious voice. Um, and I will, if it's an anxiety voice, I say, you know, I, I can understand what you're doing. I think you're really trying to be useful. I think you're really trying to help this, help Johnny or Susie. I think you have a lot of good intentions, but I think you're missing the mark. And I, and I say, how is it going? And they usually say, it's going terribly. They're not listening to me. Life's a mess, right? And I said, I think you're causing more problems than you're actually solving. Then I may bring over another chair, have the patient move to this chair, and this would be the chair of the, what we call healthy adult mode in schema therapy or the ego in psychodynamic thinking. And basically the patients say, you know something, this is my life. It's not your life, talking to the critic. I do not work for you. Right? And trying to create a new life where they go from a super ego driven life to an ego driven life, a life of choice, a life of decision, a life of you know, choosing one's values. Right? Again, this is not going to take, happen in one day, but this is a beginning, you know, 
rearranging the energy and the patterns. Um, but it's the beginning of kind of a, you know, a, of pushing back and fighting back and claiming power. This is my life. I don't work for you. The goal for the critic is to become an advisor. That's, the critic is not going away, but the healthy role of the critic is to advise, to help try and keep safe, that they can dialogue between the two parts. But one thing I should warn you about is that some patients do not want to do that. Some patients actually do not want to take responsibility for their lives. They want to continue in a life where there's a, like a parental voice, and they behave like a child, and this voice in their head tells them what to do. Because the idea of existential responsibility is frightening or terrifying. So just be aware that some people will, will not want to do this. They will not want to claim that power. That will disturb them, and they will rather keep things the way, way it is. And um, I have patients who say to me all the time, they'll say things like, and so I said to myself, you should do this. They talk to themselves in the second person all the time. I always say, who are you talking to? Right? Who are you talking to? And the person who's actually doing the work never speaks. It's this voice telling them what to do. I hear this very commonly. Right? So it's an interesting idea. But, uh, but some people are like, I will claim power. This is my life. I will make my own decisions. Paul Chadwick is a cognitive behavioral therapist in uh, England, in, near London, and he works with severely mentally ill patients, patients with schizophrenia, chronic manic depression, chronic psychosis, people are marginal people, people with all kinds of difficulties. And he said, these people tend to have terrible self-concepts. They think they're useless, worthless people. Um, you know, just, oh, they should never have been born, completely defective, terrible sense of self. And he said, you, you cannot really do cognitive therapy with these people. You cannot persuade them that this is a distortion in some way, that this is uh, you know, somehow a mistake in their interpretation of life. There's just so much evidence that people told them, and, and they look at their lives. So he sits down with them, and he says, so, so tell me all the bad things about yourself that seems to be on your mind. You know, so you know, I'm fat, lazy, ugly, stupid, useless, and I never should have been born. Very good. And then he'll work with, it. have you ever done anything good, anything kind, anything generous, anything loving, anything beautiful? Well, you know, I brought, mothers, I brought flowers to my mother on Mother's Day. I took care of Susie's cat. I, I, I gave, my, gave, some, gave my lunch to Tom last week. One of my patients once ran into a burning building to uh, save some kittens. I write letters for MNC International. So he creates a kind of a, you know, a script about the good things they do. And then uh, you know, he'll take out two chairs. And I actually do this, usually do this standing up. So here be the negative voice. I'm fat, lazy, ugly, stupid, and useless, and I never should have been born. And here be the positive one. I'm kind, loving, generous, courageous, and I care about the suffering of the world. And back here, I'm fat, lazy, ugly, stupid, useless, I never should have been born. I'm kind, loving, generous, compassionate, and I care about the world. Fat, lazy, ugly, stupid, kind, loving, generous, compassionate. Fat, lazy, ugly, stupid, kind, loving, generous, compassionate. And I have to go back and forth between these two chairs. And what we're trying to do here is create complexity of self. When the patient entered the therapy, they were a bad person. That was, the, that was basically the only message inside their mind. But after doing this, I am a bad person, but I am also a good person. And now there is greater complexity of self. And that leads to possibilities and leads to shifting of mood and things like that. It is amazing how fast this works. I've been just awestruck how fast this new voice begins to get um, created. So why are the chairs this way? Because this is a very powerful voice. This has been there a very long time. It's very strong and very deep. This is a very fragile voice. We're slowly creating this voice. Right? We need to keep working with it. I don't want these parts to dialogue with each other because this one will destroy this one. So I keep them, I keep them separate. Down the road, maybe there's a dialogue, but right now, we keep these voices separate, but each gets a chance to speak. We don't deny this voice, because that wouldn't work, but we're going to nurture this voice as a new possibility of self. So bringing things to an end, why use chairs? Well, chairs, I think, give us a whole other dimension in our therapeutic work. It gives us the dimension of space. It really helps us to differentiate the voices. As I've said before, sometimes we're in one voice and we're in another the next day. They don't get to engage with each other. We get to clarify things. 
We can put things outside of ourselves, bad objects or destructive schemas. We have sort of this dimension. We put them away from ourselves. We can look at them. Dr. Marvin uh, Goldfried, who was one of the, the great leaders in cognitive behavioral therapy, said the, the, the criticism of cognitive therapy is that people say, I understand it, but I don't feel it, right? And he uses chair work because he says, I seek emotional arousal. I seek sort of neurobiological arousal, and chair work allows me to do that. And if people are in a more emotionally aroused state, it will facilitate changes in cognition, right? It's one thing to talk about it. It's nothing to stand up and shout it or yell about it or speak powerfully about it standing up. And lastly, traumatized patients in, in schema therapy, we often do imagery or scripting. We ask patients to close their eyes and go back into the trauma. Many patients say, you know, I'm not going to sit here with my eyes closed. I don't feel safe doing that. That's not going to happen. And now we can work with trauma using our eyes, with our eyes open. Some of you may say, well, these sound, this sounded very interesting, but can I use chair work with fill in the blank? This kind of patient, patient low SES, immigrant patients, patients who don't speak, in my case, English, in your case, probably Portuguese, um, you know, patients who are, you know, uh, seem very sort of uh, undeveloped, and the answer is, chair work can be used with any patient who has a problem that is suitable for a chair work dialogue. It doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. It doesn't matter what the, what the, uh, who the patient is. What matters is, why is this patient in therapy? And when you know why the patient is in therapy, what the therapeutic issue is, you can use chair work. And right now, we're seeing a renaissance of chair work throughout the world, and people are using chair work for every diagnostic condition under the sun. So you can use chair work with any patient. Having said that, you may have to make major adjustments in terms of pacing and style and complexity, et cetera, et cetera, but you can use chair work with any patient. And lastly, keep in mind that a central goal of this work is for the patient to be able to express each voice as distinctly, forcefully, and simply as possible. And if you hear this lecture and you just say, you know, I don't think chair work's for me, that of course is fine. But if you go back to your office and you work with your patient, you say, let me get them to speak each voice very clearly, distinctly, forcefully, simply, that will change your practice. Speaking very clearly and, and distinctly energizes things and will probably change the work you do as well. And I think even for Pearls, a great deal of the work he did was just getting people to speak distinctly and clearly from one voice at a time. So hopefully you'll walk away from this talk with the sense that chair was exciting, it's an effective change technique, has extraordinary flexibility, and as I think you've seen, we can use it with a wide range of problems. And I thank you for your attention.